Today, uh, again, is March 3rd. We're hearing arguments via Zoom, and our last argument will be case number 21AP0023, Ott versus Ott. As you can tell, the panel this morning is Judge Carr, Judge Callahan, and myself, Judge Tidosio. I'll be presiding and keeping track of time. Um, as each of you will have 15 minutes to present your arguments. Uh, Attorney Schreiner, if you plan on reserving uh, time for rebuttal, you can reserve up to five minutes. Just let me know before you start, and I'll keep track of that time for you and let you know as you approach your rebuttal time. We ask that you mute yourself when you're not arguing, since these are being recorded and posted on the court's YouTube channels. And we ask that you uh, abide by the rule that since these are online, we ask that you refrain from using the names of any children uh, during your presentation. Judge Carr, Judge Callahan, and I have read the briefs and we are prepared to proceed when you are. So let me just ask uh, before I start you on the clock, Attorney Schreiner, would you like to reserve some time? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I would like to reserve five minutes. All right, I'll let you know as you get close. All thank right, you. with that, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Roseanne Schreiner, and may it please the court, I do represent uh, the appellant in this matter, Catherine Ott. Uh, we filed an appeal in this matter with regard to um, four assignments of error. Um, I would like to uh, pay attention today to um, specifically assignment of error number one and assignment of error number four. Uh, the first assignment of error deals with the um, asset that was located or is located at 356 Daly Road in Worcester, Ohio. The parties in this matter are Richard Ott and Catherine Ott. They began their relationship in 1993. Uh, in 2005, they began residing together at the residence located at 356 Daly Road in Worcester, Ohio. Catherine and Richard were then married in March of 2009, March 30th of 2009. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, Catherine's uh, grandson came to reside with them because she had legal custody of him. The parties later separated in April of 2019 um, after a domestic dispute. Catherine filed a complaint for divorce in April of 2019 and prior to the final hearing dismissed that complaint. Richard then filed a new complaint for divorce on June 24th, 2020. It is of that complaint that we, um, the disposition of that complaint that we filed our appeal. Uh, turning to the first assignment of error, uh, my argument with regard to the property of 356 Daily Road is that the trial court mischaracterized that property as Mr. Ott's separate property and failed to recognize it as a marital property and dispose of it accordingly. Um, Ms. Ott argues that Mr. Ott, Ott failed to provide by preponderance of evidence that the real estate was his separate property and he failed to establish that any equity existed in the Daily Road residence at the time of the party's marriage. Ms. Ott recognizes that the purchase of the property did occur prior to the party's marriage. Um, Ms. Ott also recognizes that she resided in the residence that entire time, contributed to the expenses of that property, including the mortgage, the utilities, and insurance, and taxes. <clears throat> the parties later married, and then at the time of their marriage, Mr. Ott testified that he didn't believe that there was any equity in the property. Ms. Ott argues that in order to properly, properly support a separate property claim, as Mr. Ott has stated to the court, he needs to show the court that there was equity that existed at the time of their marriage and it's not enough to just say that he owned the property prior to the marriage. Catherine points to one case in particular uh, that was uh, held by the 8th District Court of Appeals. It's Woit v. Woit. And in that case, uh, similarly, the, uh, the owner of the home had, prior, had purchased the home prior to the party's marriage. Parties married later there was a divorce that occurred. He indicated that it was his separate property. The trial court agreed with that. And then the court of appeals overturned that uh, decision stating that although it was clear that he had owned the property prior to marriage, he did not show that there was any equity that existed in the property at the time that they were married. 
and that it's not enough just to show that you owned the property prior to marriage, but you also need to show to the court when making a separate property claim that there was equity that existed in the home at the time of marriage. In this case, Mr. Ott was given an opportunity on several occasions to show that there was some sort of equity that existed in the house at the time that the parties married. He failed to do that. In fact, he agreed that there was no equity that existed in the, in the property at the time of the party's marriage. In addition to the issue that was argued in Voight and that Ms. Ott also argues in this case, we would also state to the court that during the party's marriage, this property was refinanced on several occasions. The property, um, Mr. Ott actually testified that he refinanced the property. Um, and it is clear from the mortgage balances that the mortgage actually had increased over the time of their marriage. So not only do we argue that you no know, exist, uh, equity existed in the house prior to the marriage, which would be necessary for a separate property argument, but we also argue that during the marriage, more debt was accrued on this property. The mortgage was increased and Ms. Ott during the marriage also helped take care of that debt as well. Ms. Ott, um, through testimony, and Mr. Ott actually confirmed this, all of the mortgage payments came out of the party's joint account. However, Ms. Ott is the only one who funded that joint account. It was her paycheck that went into the joint account, and Mr. Ott's paycheck went into his own savings account. Now, Mr. Ott argued that he would make cash withdrawals and he would give them to Catherine Ott or he would uh, deposit them into the account. And Ms. Ott indicated that on occasions that did happen, but on occasions and more often it did not happen. And so her financial contribution to the marriage and her paychecks that were going into that joint account, that's what was paying for the expenses related to this marital residence. And Mr. Ott was not contributing. Ms. Ott indicated and Mr. Ott also agreed that he had a drug dependency issue during the marriage. And Ms. Ott believes that a lot of those cash withdrawals that he made during the marriage went to support his addiction. And so before we get into all that, I want to make sure I understand what, sure. what was actually happening here. So uh, there's no dispute that he bought the property prior to the marriage. Uh, both parties agree that there was no equity in the home at the time of marriage. Correct. Is, that, is that correct? Now, my understanding is that he uh, actually... Um, refinance prior to the marriage at one point. Yes. And then once the marriage was in place during the pendency of the marriage, he, he they refinanced again. And I'm not saying this is dispositive, but I'm just trying to figure out the his name was the only one on the more on the mortgage. Uh, the property was in his name. It, when they refinanced, was it based on both her incomes or do you know was anything in the record about that? There was nothing in the record with regard to um, whose income was taken into consideration when the refinancing occurred. Um, I would indicate to the court that the mortgage did not change um, with regard to who the holder of the mortgage was. It remained in Mr. Ott's name. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, however, the even though the mortgage in the residence re remained in Mr. Ott's name, uh, Ms. Ott was the one making those mortgage payments, the insurance payments, the tax payments, each and every month so that, that that payment was due and continuing to make sure that they stayed afloat with regard to that expense. Again, Mr. Ott tried to argue that he gave her cash. Um, Ms. Ott said that that didn't cover the mortgage. And again, she indicates that she believes that the cash withdrawals were going to his addiction and not to the marital expenses. <clears throat> The other issue that we would like to raise with regard to the um, marital property is that the parties resided together prior to their marriage um, and at the time that this, part, this um, property was purchased. And Ms. Ott indicated that she continued to contribute to the expenses of the household even though they weren't married. And um, this is a court of equity. And we would argue that it would be inequitable to not recognize that she has a claim to this property, even though it was purchased in his sole name, Mr. Ott's sole name, prior to their marriage. 
Turning now to the issue of spousal support, uh, the trial court failed to award Ms. Ott any type of spousal support. The trial court indicated that they believe since she continued to reside in the marital residence um, during the time of their separation, that that would suffice for any type of spousal support that she would be entitled to. Um, we would argue that that um, is not an appropriate decision with regard to spousal support. Um, specifically, um, we believe that the mortgage payment would not be commiserate with the amount of spousal support that she would be entitled to. And we also believe that the amount of time that she resided in the home after the party's separation would not be reflective of the amount of time or duration that she would be entitled to spousal support. Uh, Ms. Ott was not working um, outside of the home at the time of the party's separation or shortly thereafter, and she continued to not be working outside of the home. Uh, she had previously worked at Akron Brass, however, that employment had ended, and it had ended due to medical complications. Uh, Mr. Ott even acknowledged that he knew that she was under the care of Dr. Siebel, and Dr. Siebel had indicated that he did not believe that she would be able to return to that type of <clears throat> type of that work. alarm is a good signal. So <laughs> you're, you're you know what it was for, right? <laughs> if you if you want to continue, you can, but you'll be into your rebuttal time. Uh, just briefly, Your Honor. Um, All right, I'm gonna start, start the clock again. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with, with regard to um, her. Uh, her medical issues and that her doctor had specifically indicated that he had concerns that she would ever be able to return to factory work, which is what she had accomplished at um, Akron Brass. I will indicate to the court that the record is very clear that these parties have very different incomes. Um, my client was doing odd jobs and trying to make ends meet as much as she could at the time of the trial and at the time of the party separation and throughout. Uh, Mr. Ott, contrary to that, was earning $42,140.80 per year as a base and receiving somewhere between $19,000 to $21,000 in overtime and then bonuses as well. His income for 2020 was $62,089.45. And that's all in the record. And so it's clear that these parties had a large disparity of income and they also have a long-term marriage. Um, one of the other issues that we argue is duration of marriage. Uh, that was not argued by either side as to asking the court to make a de facto termination date of marriage. However, the trial court took it upon themselves to have a shorter term of marriage and to use the party's date of separation as a de facto term end date of marriage rather than the presumed date, which would have been when we went to court for this final hearing. So for those reasons, we would ask the court to review our briefs and make a decision that would support our request to sustain our assignments of error. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's going to leave you with about uh, three minutes and 15 seconds for rebuttal. I'll set my yeah. alarm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Attorney Reynolds, uh, you'll have 15 minutes. Thank you, uh, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Craig Reynolds. I represent uh, the FLE Richard Ott in this case. Um, Richard Ott purchased the home in question in 2003. Uh, appellant is arguing that she moved in there in 2005 and somehow moving in there two years after my client purchased the home made it a marital asset. Um, the debt, the, the home and the debt were in Mr. Ott's sole name at that time. When he refinanced it before they married, it remained in his sole name. And when they refinanced it after they were married, it remained in his sole name. Uh, certainly if Mrs. Ott's income were being included and she was going to be on the mortgage, that would have required her to be on the deed as well. And, and that never happened. Um, the, appellant argues that the Voight case applies to this. And in the Voight case, uh, the homeowner was trying to trace his uh, down payment on the property 
as a premarital asset. And the court said, it's not enough to just show what your down payment is. You have to show that there was at least that much equity in the house. And that's not what this case is about. This home and the debt were always in Mr. Ott's name, no one else's name. We know that the debt grew during the marriage. It was $104,000 on the date they got married. It was $109,000 in 2020 when, when they appeared in court for, uh, for their divorce. I'm sorry. Yeah, that is right in 2020. Counsel, but in regard to that, didn't the trial court find that there is no equity in the house at the uh, time of divorce or during the marriage? I think that's correct. They, and they found that the house had not improved during the marriage either. They found that the house had actually gotten worse during the marriage and was in deplorable condition, according to uh, Mrs. Zott. She has been in... Counsel, I... You have, you have such a limited time. If you don't mind, I'm gonna uh, direct you back to the question I was asking about the, the mortgage and the equity, I mean, about the equity in the house. Mm -hmm. So if during the course of the marriage, as the trial court found, and at the time of separation, there was no equity, how is it that more was owed on the mortgage? Because you can only owe more on a mortgage if you refinance and get a, a cash out. In other words, there had to be some equity in the house in order to be able to owe more on the mortgage. I, I don't know what banks uh, require when they're lending more money, but they certainly took more money out, Mr. Ott did, and they spent it during the marriage. So he's left with a premarital home that he owes more debt on today than he owed on the day that he got married. Um, any appreciation in the value of the home, which was due to property values going up, is a passive uh, appreciation. That's never a marital asset uh, on, a, on a separate property claim. Um, there was no evidence of any improvements on the property. Um, in fact, the evidence was just that the property had gotten in worse shape during the marriage. Um, we believe that there was competent, credible evidence to support the trial court's decision. Uh, the, the appellant hasn't met the against the manifest weight of the evidence uh, burden, and the trial court's decision on that matter should be withheld or upheld. Um, the, the next two assignments of error about the uh, insurance proceeds and the the cars uh, that those division of property issues that's that's an abuse of discretion standard and appellant is cherry picking a couple items out and saying fix these but ignore the other division of property things in this case the trial court awarded the appellant uh, a property that she acquired during the divorce uh, in Ashland County uh, and didn't give my client anything to offset that property. Uh, the trial court ordered my client to pay $12,900 of debt and ordered Mrs. Ott to pay $6,600 in debt. And so, uh, you know, to say awarding my client a 28 year old car that's worth $100 is inequitable ignores the rest of the division of property in this case. Um, the court has to view the entire division of property and, and decide did the trial court abuse its discretion in awarding the car to my client and in, in, in saying there's no evidence that any of the insurance proceeds that were paid out in 2018 and 2019, there's no evidence that any of that money still exists uh, but to the extent that it does exist, the court found that that money was to go to fixing up the odd home that had suffered water damage. And so Mr. Odd, if any of it is left, should be allowed to keep it. Counsel, uh, counsel yes. I'm not sure I understand that because um, the court found that the, um, that the proceeds, the insurance proceeds were to go to the house. Obviously, that's what insurance proceeds are for. Are for, but right. was there any testimony that that they were bound to uh, fix up their house? 
There, there was no testimony of that. In fact, Mr. Ott's been out of the house since the spring of 2019. So, um, and he had the last $6,500 when he left in the spring of 2019. Um, the money that was paid out in 2018, there was no evidence of what became of that money. Um, okay, but, but you're agreeing that there was some money from the insurance proceeds left at the time of the separation. Yes. Um, but I certainly think that whatever money there was at the time of separation was completely offset by assigning Mr. Ott to pay $12,900 of debt and Mrs. Ott to pay $6,600 of debt and she can keep her property in Ashland County. Well, I understand what you're arguing, but that's not what the trial court found, right? That is what the trial court found. Well, the didn't the trial court actually find that the proceeds of the insurance were to fix up the house, so therefore neither neither party were entitled, she was not entitled to them because it could only go to fix up the house? I, I think I'm, I'm looking at my notes, Your Honor. I believe the trial court said there's no evidence that the, pro the insurance proceeds exist to the extent that they still exist they were intended to be used on Mr. Ott's home, and so he gets to keep them if they exist. With regard to the spousal support claim, during the marriage, Mr. and Mrs. Ott made virtually identical sums of money, $30,000 a year. Mrs. Ott hasn't worked since 2018, but the evidence was clear that she was capable of working, that she'd been offered a job within walking distance of her home, but she chose not to take that job. Um, the court found that she's made no meaningful attempt to work in four years, even though she was capable of working. Mr. Rott, given the loss of his, his wife's $30,000 a year income, has worked every bit of overtime that he can work since the separation. And he has increased his income in 2020 to $60,000 a year by, by working literally 80 hour weeks. The court found that given the fact that their incomes during the marriage were virtually identical, given the fact that Mrs. Ott chose not to work when she was capable of doing so, uh, and given the fact that she has been living rent-free in Mr. Ott's separate property since April of 2019, that it was not appropriate for there to be any spousal support. Um, that again is a, a question, did the trial court abuse its discretion in making that decision? Um, and I would, I would submit that they did not. In fact, by filing this appeal, Ms. Ott has guaranteed that she gets to remain in the house until this appeal process is over. Um, that may be, it, it's, it's been over a year uh, at this point that she's been allowed to reside in my client's separate property. Um, and it will certainly be another period of time before this case has been decided. Uh, they were married in 09. They separated in April of 19. She's been living rent-free for next month. It'll be three years. Was uh, there a stay granted then by the trial court during the pendency yes. of the appeal? And, and by the appellate court. I think okay. both courts granted a stay. There's definitely a stay in place. And I think both courts granted that. Um, we believe that there was evidence to support the trial court's decision on each of these issues, and we would ask that the appellant's assignments of error be overruled. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, thank you. Let me see, uh, ask my colleagues here, Judge Callahan, do you have any further questions? And no. Judge? No, All thank right. you. Though. Thank you, Attorney Reynolds. Uh, now, Attorney Schreiner, you've got that three minutes and 15 seconds you can use. Thank you, Your Honor. 
I just wanted to um, follow up where Attorney Reynolds left off um, with regard to the stay. There was a stay that was requested by the trial court and the trial court granted that but required a bond to be posted by my client in order for that to occur. Uh, with that said, my client couldn't afford the bond and so then we asked the Court of Appeals to issue a stay. Uh, a, the appellee didn't file a response so by default we received that stay. Um, so when he argues that she's been residing in the home for three years rent free, well, he didn't argue that that would continue to happen or should not continue to happen while these proceedings uh, were in place. I also wanted to follow up on the insurance proceeds issue um, with regard to the insur insurance proceeds. Uh, the insurance proceeds existed at the time that they um, separated, and that's in the record because the reason that they had a domestic dispute in April of 2019 was directly related to those insurance proceeds. Uh, the check was in or the cash was in my client's purse. Uh, Mr. Ott didn't like that, and so he ended up taking the purse and ripping it off of my client's person. The purse opened up, shattered, and uh, he took the money, and then he was gone. So it absolutely existed as of the time of their separation. With regard to the vehicle that Attorney Reynolds um, was arguing, it, it is an argument that also should be considered with regard to the spousal support issue. My client does not have a working vehicle. She was awarded the Ford Explorer, which there was testimony, it did not work, it was junk, it hadn't worked for years, and that rodents were residing in it rather than it being used. Mr. Ott had a vehicle that he was able to use that was furnished by his family, and he also had the party Suburban that he was able to use. If the court is saying that Ms. Ott can work, how is she supposed to get to work if she doesn't have a working vehicle to get there? So she asked the court to award her the Suburban at the very least in order to be able to get transported and get some sort of job that she would be able to do in light of her medical condition. And we're talking about a $100 vehicle according to Mr. Ott. So when he makes an argument about, well, he got most of the debt and therefore he shouldn't get this vehicle, it was a $100 vehicle. And my client also offered that her property that she had purchased, um, which was worth $2,000 at most, um, could be sold and, and those proceeds could be split. So she wasn't asking for that to be allocated to her. What she asked for was a vehicle so she could try to obtain some sort of financial security. And my last issue that I wanted to, to point to is with regard to the income issue for spousal support purposes. When the court talked about her income and that she um, had income that was the same as Mr. Ott's, that's actually not something that should be taken into consideration or she shouldn't be imputed with income for spousal support purposes. This court in the Collins v. Collins case specifically said that you cannot impute income to an individual when we're discussing spousal support. You can with child support, but not spousal support. And Ms. Schreiner, your alarm should be going off because your time <laughs> is up. I learned to silence it this time. Okay. <laughs> Thank well, you, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> Thank you both for um, your arguments today. I know we were running a little bit late due to some technical issues. So, uh, you know, on behalf of Judge Callahan, Judge Carr, we certainly appreciate your patience with us this morning. Uh, it was a well-argued case. We're going to take it under advisement. We'll issue a decision in due course. We'll have the clerk of courts make sure you get a copy of the decision on the day it's released. And you can also find them uh, on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website where our decisions are posted. We're going to be adjourned until